Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Australian Food Mechanics seminar series. Or today's speaker is uh, Dr. Silva Liz from uh, Imperial College London. He has a PhD from University of Porte in France and in the field of fluid mechanics and computational fluid dynamics. And he's a reader in the Department of Aeronautics at College, uh, Imperial College London. And he has developed a highly parallel, uh, finite difference, a highly scalable flow server for the turbulent flows. And his research interest is at the moment currently on wake to wake interaction in wind frame and uh, wind farms and uh, control of the shear flows, immersed boundary methods and neural network in CFD and particle laden gravity uh, uh, current. And he's going to give us a talk on his solver, which is the X compact 3D framework. And with this, I'm handing over to him. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, and uh, also thank you very much, Kat and uh, Sharam, for inviting me uh, uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to, to present my, my research um, to you guys, and I will try to stick to a 45-50 minutes presentation. So um, this is uh, the title of my presentation, and um, basically, as uh, you can see, uh, sorry, I need here we are. Um, you can see this is the outline of my presentation. I will uh, start with a short introduction about uh, turbulent flow and high performance computing. And then my, my uh, talks will be divided mainly in two parts. The first part will be related to uh, the numerics that um, I am using to study turbulent flows. And the second part will be focusing on, on applications. There, there might be a few equations in the uh, uh, numerics part, and there will be more uh, fancy pictures and some movies in the uh, applications. And then I will finish my uh, presentation with uh, conclusion. Um, before starting, uh, I would like to, uh, this is my uh, thank you slide to thank uh, all the people listing uh, on this slide, uh, in particular, Professor Lambale, Professor Vasilikos, and Professor Silvestrini, who have been supporting um, the X Compact 3D framework uh, over the year, um, financially, morally, and uh, with uh, a lot of resources. And also listed are uh, some of my PhD students and, and postdocs uh, over the years who have contributed to the slides that I'm going to present today. And finally, I would like to thank um, the, the funding bodies that are supporting my research, UKRI, U, a PSRC in the UK, these are the research councils, and uh, PRACE in Europe, who is providing computational resources on um, very nice supercomputers in France, Spain, Italy, uh, and, and Germany. Right, so today my presentation is about uh, turbulence. So you, you may know that uh, turbulence is everywhere around us. Uh, turbulence can be uh, can happen in nature without uh, uh, humans. So you can see some uh, avalanche, you can see some uh, gravity currents, you can see the cloud. Uh, also turbulence can be generated by, uh, by humans. So you, you have uh, a picture of, of the, of the uh, turbulence generated by an aircraft. You have a, a picture of, uh, of um, wind turbine, which is, is burning, but uh, thanks to the smoke, it's possible to see the, the, the turbulence generated by, by the wake of, of the turbine. And of course, you have the smoke of, uh, of a cigarette that is transitioning from a laminar state to a turbulent state. So basically, my point here is that turbulence is everywhere around us. And what we are trying to do in my research group and what I've been trying to do in the last uh, 15 years is trying to better understand turbulence, but more importantly, trying to see if there are ways to uh, manipulate turbulence to uh, our benefit. Uh, the best example being the flow around uh, an aircraft. Is it possible to reduce the drag uh, generated by uh, the turbulence? And is it possible to do some um, some saving, some fuel saving. This is just one example out of many about uh, controlling turbulence. So you have different way of studying turbulence. You can do experiments, of course, 
uh, you can develop some uh, theoretical models and you can also study turbulence using uh, supercomputers and using high performance computer. And this is what I'm going to talk today. I'm going to talk about how can we study turbulent flows, how can we learn how to manipulate them using high performance computer. When we talk about high performance computing, um, we are talking about the most powerful supercomputers available for academic research um, in the world. And uh, you can see on this slide a um, few pictures about uh, the um, supercomputers. Uh, the big one uh, here uh, that is in, in Barcelona, it's in a church. It's in a church because in Barcelona, uh, in Spain, it's really hot. Um, so uh, they decided to put uh, the, this supercomputer called Mareno Strom in the church because the church is much cooler than a normal building. So they are making a lot of saving in terms of uh, a cooling system. The Summit is, is a system in, in the US, uh, is the most powerful uh, computer in America. You have uh, Fugaku in Japan who is the most powerful computer in the world, uh, Archer in the UK, uh, Sunnel White uh, in China, and I think you have Magnus uh, in, in Australia. So we are talking about big systems that are based on CPUs and, and GPUs, and we are talking about hundreds of uh, thousand uh, computational core. And so obviously, as you can imagine, um, using efficiently those supercomputers is very challenging to study uh, turbulent flows. Uh, we have a set of well-known equations, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, uh, they are not that complicated, but uh, there are a few issues because of the non-locality, non-stationarity, and non-linearity. When these uh, three features are combined together, it makes them, uh, the, the, those equations are, are virtually impossible to solve analytically, except for very simple problems. So we need to find ways to model them. There's a, a lot of different uh, flow solvers that are available on the market. Some of them are working very nicely on supercomputers. Some are, are, are not working very nicely. But today I'm going to present what I think is um, a, a very successful uh, cocktail. I say the cocktail to, to solve uh, turbulence on high performance computing. And the key ingredient for, for this cocktail are um, a Cartesian mesh and high order finite different schemes. And I'm going to explain why I think uh, this cocktail is very successful. Um, we are going to talk about immersive boundary method, which is a technique to uh, add um, some solid bodies uh, inside the Navier-Stokes equation and inside the computational domain, a spectral solver for the Poisson equation for efficiency. Uh, I will talk about the parallelization strategy, which is based on a 2D domain decomposition. And I will talk about uh, numerical dissipation uh, and how we can use this to our advantage to simulate uh, a wider range of computational flow. So all this successful cocktail um, has been developed in a framework called X Compact 3D. And if you look carefully behind the X, um, it used to be in Compact 3D because we used to focus only on the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, but now we are expanding our framework to deal with uh, a, a wider range of, of, of flow configuration. And I will be presenting the equations very soon. So for the first part of this presentation, I'm going to focus on, on the numerics. So to start with, on the uh, left-hand side here, you can see uh, the equations. These are um, the compressible equations, the compressible Navier-Stokes equation in the low max number limit. So basically, we are solving the Navier-Stokes equations, but we are, we are, we are avoiding any uh, acoustic uh, issues, any acoustic waves. So we are in the low max number uh, limit. And basically, what we are focusing on, we are focusing on um, flow for which the Mach number is smaller to 0 0.3. Of course, when the density is constant in those equations, you will recover the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so these are the equations that, that um, we are solving and we are doing this um, with, uh, on a Cartesian mesh um, with a conventional uh, fractional step uh, method. So we are solving the right hand side of the equations, then we are doing the integration in time, then we obtain uh, Poisson equations that we are solving uh, in the spectral space, uh, and then we get the pressure gradient, and then we correct the velocity to, uh, to get the, the, new, uh, uh, the new velocity at the next time step and to ensure incompressibility of the flow, and then we do whatever post-processing that, uh, uh, that we need 
and then we do the next time step and so on and so on. So this is roughly uh, an overview of the framework in terms of tools and I'm going to focus on this uh, in the next few slides. We are going to talk about finite different schemes and about uh, fast Fourier transformation and about uh, 2D domain decomposition. So as I said before, I'm talking about a, a successful cocktail to uh, deal with turbulent flows. And the, the, the first key uh, ingredient is the Cartesian mesh. It means that in my, in my career, I never had to worry about uh, mesh generation or about uh, distorted mesh or about mesh issues and so on. I'm always using a Cartesian mesh, irrespectful of the flow configuration. So you may, and we are going to discuss this, you may think that, oh, maybe uh, uh, this is limited to a simple flow configuration, but I will show you that actually this is not necessarily the case and you can do a fairly complicated uh, flow configuration even on using a Cartesian mesh. So basically for me, the, the, the time spent to generate the mesh is uh, negligible. I don't have to worry about the mesh generation. So that's, that's the first important thing. It, it can be an issue when you are generating very complicated mesh and on a very large scale supercomputers, uh, this, this can be extremely costly um, to generate the mesh. So for us, it's not a problem. The second thing is that because we are using a Cartesian mesh, it means that we can use high order methods. And we know now, and I will show you this in a moment, that high order methods are superior to low, to low order method for turbulent flows because you can, for a given resolution, you can capture a wider range of uh, scale. And this is going to be very important in terms of cost. So in the X compact 3D framework, we are using six order schemes. So if you, are using, if you are wondering why six, why not eight, why not 10 or four, it's just a, a good compromise between accuracy and uh, simulation cost. So the, the velocity nodes are always located uh, at the same mesh. So this is the, the dark dot here. And uh, to compute the first derivative, we are using this type of scheme. Of course, you must be familiar with uh, alpha equals zero and B equals zero. So a standard second order um, scheme. But here we have a, a, a B and alpha non-zero. And you can see that because alpha is non-zero here, uh, the, the schemes are implicit. So we need to invert a three diagonal uh, matrix. So it's, it's a little bit more expensive, but because of this implicit nature, we are going to see that the, those schemes have a, a quasi spectral uh, properties. For the pressure treatment, our pressure velocity, um, sorry, our pressure uh, field is staggered by alpha mesh with respect to the velocity. So we are also using a uh, first derivative to go from a staggered mesh to uh, the main uh, mesh. But basically these are the schemes that, that we are using. One key feature of those schemes is that uh, you can use them in the physical space when it is uh, advantageous to do that. But also you can do a similar operation in the Fourier space and it's going to be very important for the Poisson equation. So you may know that uh, if you are going in the Fourier space and if you want to do a derivative, you just need to multiply by the, the wave number and I. The, um, so if you want to compute an exact derivative, you just multiply by I K, K being the wave number. Now, if you want not to have uh, the exact derivative, but you want to mimic exactly your six order scheme, then you can switch the wave number with the modify wave number and the modify wave number is given by this formula here. And if you switch to do that, it means that there's a strict equivalence between uh, this scheme in the physical space and this scheme in the Fourier space. So it means that by using the modify wave number, you can switch from a derivative in the physical space or a derivative in the Fourier space. And it's the same for uh, when you are going to do a, an integration, you can do your integration in the physical space or you can do your integration in the Fourier space. And for the Poisson equation, integration in the Fourier space is very easy. Instead of doing a multiplication, you do a division, right? So for the Poisson equations, we are going to use this uh, modify wave number concept. And basically, instead of um, solving the Poisson equation in the, in the physical space, we are going to do it in the Fourier space. It's very easy. You go, you do one fast Fourier transform, you go in the Fourier space, you do your division by the modified wave number, you go back to the physical space and boom, you have your pressure field. You don't have to use any iterative solver that can be extremely expensive. 
this is uh, also for uh, a valid concept for um, interpolation. So when you want to go from the uh, pressure mesh to the velocity mesh or from the velocity mesh to the pressure mesh, you can also use, uh, you can also do that in the Fourier space using a transfer function given by this relation. And once again, a, a six order interpolation in the physical space as a strict equivalent uh, in the Fourier space. So once again, we have this flexibility of switching from the physical space to the Fourier space and using the, the most efficient way of calculating our derivative interpolation or integration. Right, uh, just one slide to highlight uh, how important it is to use high order uh, schemes. This is um, a representation of the, the wave number uh, K and the modified wave number K prime. So when you are doing your derivative and if you are using the exact wave number, uh, you will get the exact solution. And this is uh, highlighted here in black. Here, zero to one, we are going from a, a large scale to small scale. What you can see is the conventional second order schemes is this is the red plot here. It's highly um, inaccurate because you are missing uh, all those uh, small scale here, right? Whereas if you are using a compact six order scheme in blue here, for a wide range of scale here, you are very close to what you would have with a, a, a spectral derivative, what you would have with the exact derivative, and you are only missing uh, some uh, small scale here. And this is uh, exactly the same for uh, the second uh, derivative here. You can see that uh, a second order derivative is not very accurate for the small scale, it's fine for the large scale, but not for the small scale. And it's much better if you are using six order compact schemes. In practice, uh, just a small example, this is a vortex dipole rebound from a, a wall performed with the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. On the left hand side, you have the Fourier Chebyshev uh, analytical solution. I will call it, it has been achieved with uh, spectral methods on a very fine mesh. Uh, this is what you are expecting. So you have a vortex dipole that is going down and is impacting and there's a rebound here with some noise um, vortices. This is what you are supposed to get at a, at a marginal resolution uh, here, 128 by 257. You can see that six order schemes can match uh, at least visually what you will get uh, for the reference solution. Whereas if you are using a, a conventional MAC uh, second order uh, method, you will get something that is not correct. For the large scale here, for this part of the, um, of the dipole, you can see that everything is fine. But when you have fine uh, and small scale, you can see that uh, the second order is unable to reproduce. You get something, but this is incorrect. So this is why we are advocating that uh, using uh, six order methods or higher method is much more beneficial. This is another example for a turbulent 3D periodic uh, channel flow. And you can see that once again, at marginal resolution, the second order schemes are not able to capture uh, uh, the main flow feature. And there are some discrepancies with the reference data. Of course, don't get me wrong, if you increase the resolution, the second order schemes will eventually match the reference data. But then when I say you need to increase the resolution, you need to increase the resolution maybe by a factor two, maybe by a factor three in each spatial direction. And then you will have to reduce your time step. So using second order schemes is, it can still work and can still give you some good results, but it will be uh, much more uh, costly for a uh, turbulent flow. You can see here from this example that the six order schemes at these resolutions are perfectly capable of reproducing uh, the reference data. So that was the first key ingredient of our successful cocktail to uh, simulate turbulent flow is the use of high order schemes on a Cartesian mesh. And because we're on a Cartesian mesh, those schemes are very, very efficient. Now the, the, the second uh, ingredient is how can we make use of supercomputers in an efficient manner? So a long time ago, when I started working on the X-Compact 3D framework, we were able to use one CPU core Okay, and basically uh, we were able to add a push during my PhD. I remember I was doing simulation with 30 million mesh nodes and this was simulations for, you know, two, three weeks. So it was uh, quite painful to do. Um, so the, our first step to move towards uh, supercomputing was to uh, slice the domain in one direction 
and uh, that was very nice. We were able to run some simulation with up to uh, one billion mesh node, uh, but we were the scalability of these strategies is quite is is quite limited. First of all, you cannot use a very large number of uh, processor. It, it depends on the size of your of your simulation. So uh, about ten years ago, we decided to to move to this. Uh, uh, 2D domain decomposition, and this is what we are using currently. It is at the moment CPU friendly only, uh, and it is based on uh, the 2D uh, decomp uh, library, which is open source, but uh, some research group uh, in the world have already developed a GPU uh, version of it, and we are currently uh, working with NVIDIA to, to have uh, this 2D domain decomposition ready for um, for, uh, for GPUs. So the, the question is why we decided to go with this uh, pencil and why not uh, a full 3D domain decomposition. You may remember from what I said few few slides ago that the, the schemes are implicit in, uh, in, in, in space, which means if you want, uh, if we look here in the X direction, if you want to compute the derivative in X direction, you need to know the derivatives at every point in that direction. So in order to avoid any communication during the calculation, we are using pencil here, which means that when I'm in this configuration, I can compute my derivatives in the X direction and I have no communication, I have nothing to do. I can keep the same der derivative that, that I'm using. If I want to do a derivative in the Y direction, I just need to switch everything to uh, Y pencil. If I want to do derivatives in the Z direction, I need to switch everything to Z pencil. But it might be costly, and I will show you that this is costly, but at the end of the day, when I'm doing my calculation, there is no communication. So I can do derivative interpolation in 1D at a time. And uh, it means that um, I don't need to change my derivative schemes, my interpolation schemes. I don't need to change my Poisson equation. I can use fast Fourier transform. Fast Fourier transform can be done in 1D at a time. In order to switch from the X pencil to the Y pencil to the Z pencil, I just need to use the uh, MPI all to all transposition. Now we know that global transposition can be very expensive. So what we are trying to do is, we were trying to maximize our uh, MPI all to all transposition. And I'm going to give you an example here. If you look at those four pencils here, when we switch to the Y, decomposition, they are only going to talk to those four pencils here. And it's the same if you take the front four here, they are only going to talk to the front four here. So actually we are doing MPI or to transposition, but they are done in a, in a very uh, efficient way because uh, they are only dealing with a reduced number of uh, MPI processes, processes each. So those four ones will never communicate with those uh, other ones here. So to give you an idea, we are doing about 70 transposition per time step. You might think that's quite a lot. That's quite a lot, yes. And up to 80% of the uh, time stamp cost can be spent in communication. However, uh, this is very important. It's something people are, are not necessarily familiar with, but the communication cost is not necessarily uh, linked to the scalability. And the reason why the communication percentage is so high is because our calculation part is so efficient. The, the calculation part is done with high order schemes on a Cartesian mesh. It's very efficient algorithm. Uh, they can be vectorized very efficiently. So the, the, the calculation that we are doing are very fast. So as a consequence, the, cal the, the communication part is, is quite important. So it, you should not be scared by by seeing 80% of, of uh, communication per time step. Just to give you a, an idea of the scalability of the code and how it's working well on supercomputers, you can see here, it's a very old plot, but it's still relevant. Uh, here you can see the various uh, supercomputers. Some of them are very old uh, and you can see the resolution and you can see that uh, when we tried the system in a, in a supercomputer in uh, Mira in the US, uh, we were able to try it with up to uh, 1 million uh, computational core, and you can see that the scalability is, is very good. What you can see here, you might see, oh, look here, the, the scalability is, is not very good uh, when you are pushing the, the code to its limit. Yes, uh, basically there is an, for a given supercomputer, there is an optimal number of, um, 
of mesh node pair uh, core or pair MPI process. So if your, if your simulation is quite small, and this one was a quite small one, and if you are using a, a, a large number of, uh, of core, uh, the, the, you will have too many communication of small sizes, okay? So you need to find the right balance depending on the size of your simulation. Uh, there is an optimal number of mesh node per core, depending on the supercomputer. So if you play with that, you, ca you can have uh, excellent uh, uh, scaling up to uh, 1 million uh, CPU core. So I've, I've touched on, on two uh, key ingredients uh, to, to deal with turbulence problem. The first one is the high order schemes on a Cartesian mesh. The second one is a 2D domain decomposition. Now there's two more things to do before uh, uh, we look at some example. Um, the first thing is uh, how do we simulate a solid body inside uh, the computational domain? And the third one is how can we reach high Reynolds number at a reduced cost? So we are using a very simple method. It's called uh, immersive boundary method based on a forcing term in the Navier-Stokes equation. And basically we have a, a scalar field that is equal to one inside the solid and that is equal to zero for the fluid. And basically when epsilon is equal to one, we are going to cancel Navier-Stokes inside the solid. So Navier-Stokes will be equal to zero inside the solid, resulting in a, a zero velocity inside the solid. And when epsilon is equal to zero in the fluid, we do nothing. So just to give you an example, this is uh, the 2D flow around the cylinder uh, here. So the, the first strategy, of course, as I said, is you force the velocity to zero inside the cylinder. And if we look at, uh, at the velocity profile, you will get the, the, the black profile here. So uh, this is at the top of the cylinder and then you have the cylinder, then the velocity is equal to zero inside the cylinder and then you have your velocity profile like this. The main issue with this is that here you have uh, discontinuities and with high order schemes, uh, discontinuities uh, is uh, going to generate some oscillations. So if you look at the vorticity field, in that case, it's not very evident here, but you have a lot of spurious oscillation because of the discontinuities. So what you can try to do, and this is what I will be presenting here, is that you can try to uh, create some sort of artificial flow inside the, the object to remove the discontinuity while keeping your, the correct boundary condition. The correct boundary condition is, of course, your velocity field equal to zero. So if you do this technique, you will get the green plot here. You can see that the velocity is still equal to zero, but you don't have a discontinuity here and here. Okay, and you will get something like this. The flow inside the object is completely irrelevant. It's completely artificial. It's just uh, has been designed to ensure that your uh, velocity field is uh, free from discontinuity. So, uh, of course, uh, this is another example that everyone thinks that when you are using an immersive boundary method on a Cartesian mesh and you are trying to simulate, for example, a, a cylinder, uh, you will have like what we call a staircase uh, cylinder. So instead of simulating the red um, circle here, you would simulate uh, the, um, the yellow uh, solid. Of course, this is not true. This is what you will obtain if you use immersive boundary method without too much care. What we are trying to do instead, we are trying to, to do things uh, why, with a reconstruction inside the solid, um, the solid uh, part of the simulation. And for this, we have two options. We have cubic spline uh, reconstruction or we, we can use Lagrange polynomial to reconstruct the flow. Basically, you take two or three or four points in the fluid and then you can reconstruct uh, uh, the solid. And the only uh, criteria that we are using is that you want to have a zero velocity or you want to have a target uh, velocity uh, at the location of your uh, object. And it doesn't have to be following the mesh. You can uh, find exactly the location of your solid and you can design your reconstruction based on the exact location of the solid. So this view of a, of a staircase um, uh, object is, is, not, is not relevant. The good thing about this strategy is that because you are doing one reconstruction per velocity component per direction, this is compatible with the 2D domain decomposition, and this is compatible with, uh, with moving objects, okay? So it means that uh, we can easily simulate uh, more or less complex uh, geometries uh, with a very, very good uh, accuracy. 
And I'm going to show you an example. The first example is extracted from a paper by uh, Eric Lambele. And um, this is a channel flow, but the walls are not the boundary of this uh, computational domain. The walls are uh, modeled with immersive boundary method. And this is a channel flow at Reynolds uh, Tau 300. And you can see that there is an, a, a, a perfect match with uh, a channel flow that has been obtained um, uh, with a spectral method in a conventional manner without immersive boundary method. And this paper is uh, the reference paper by uh, Awamoto. And you can see even for the first and second order moment, even for the pressure field, you can see an excellent uh, uh, agreement for, for the statistics. So we know that our immersive boundary method is working very nicely. Ironically, and this is some work that is also done by Eric Lambele at uh, the P Prime Institute in Poitiers. Ironically, it's very counterintuitive, but if you want to simulate uh, a pipe, a uh, pipe flow, right? Which is, if you think about it, if you want to do that on a, a Cartesian mesh, most of the people will think that doesn't make sense. Well, actually, we are doing some very nice uh, simulation of, of turbulent pipe flows. And so this is, the, this is the flow setup. So in order to model the pipe flow, we are using an immersive boundary method where we are reconstructing the flow inside here. So here you can see some, some nice visualization. And we looked at the statistics and when we are performing a large HD simulation, and I will show you how we are doing large HD simulation, you can see that despite not necessarily resolving the viscous sublayer, and uh, we have excellent uh, agreement with uh, DNS reference data. So this is uh, Reynolds 19,000 and you can see that uh, the mean uh, velocity profile is, is very well recovered. Even if you, the, the first, like the, for the LES, you can see that the, the resolution is, uh, is, uh, is uh, extremely poor, yet uh, you have an excellent agreement. And this is also true for the, um, for the uh, turbulent uh, quantities. So basically, with our immersive boundary method, we can simulate uh, every uh, uh, type of, of, of flow, even those that are uh, not supposed to be simulated on a, on a rectangular uh, Cartesian mesh. And if you want to learn more and discover more about those uh, pipe flow simulation, there are two papers here uh, that um, you can have a look at. One being a, a very new one uh, in GCP uh, that has been published uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, an example, we can do moving objects. Uh, this is just a very simple example. This is a moving cylinder. And, and if, we, if we compare uh, the statistics and the flow for the moving cylinder with a fixed cylinder, uh, we will get exactly, exactly the same results. So we are very confident that um, our immersive boundary method is, is working quite nicely. And I will show you uh, in a moment some application with that. One last uh, thing, and uh, after I will be done with, uh, with equation, is numerical dissipation. Right, so DNS is very often direct numerical simulation, where you are simulating all the scales is very often too expensive. So you need to find a way to to do uh, simulation cheaply. So one option is to do larger dissimulation. You can use explicit modeling and you can use implicit modeling. And we've decided to go away from explicit modeling and to focus on uh, uh, using the numerical error of the schemes to add some dissipation at the small scale. The reasoning is very simple. When you are doing a simulation and if your simulation uh, if the resolution is not good enough, your, your, your cascade of energy, your energy is going to go down from, in average, from the large scale to the small scale. But then if you don't have the small scale, you will have a pileup of energy at, at your mesh. And one way of avoiding this pileup of energy is to add artificially some dissipation. This can be done by playing with the shape of the high order schemes. And you can, you can tune uh, the, the numerical dissipation to target a specific range of scale and a specific amount of artificial dissipation. How this is done, once again, this is done with the modify wave number. In this case, we are looking at the second order derivative. This is the scheme that we are using. You can see we have A, B, C, D to give us a lot of flexibility in the shape of, of the scheme. And we have the equivalent modify wave number. So if we, if we look at a spectral study, this is what we will get. So on the left hand side here, you can see the black curve. Uh, the black curve is the, what you would get if you were doing an exact 
second uh, derivative. The, white, the red curve is what you will get with the conventional six order schemes. So you can see they are slightly uh, under dissipative. You can design those schemes here by playing with the coefficient alpha, a, b, c, and d. You can design them so that they match pretty much the, uh, an exact uh, derivative, but more importantly, you can design them so they, they are over dissipative. <coughs> Sorry, you are, they are over dissipative, but only for a given range of scale. So for the, for the large scale here, it's doing nothing different, but you start adding some dissipation here. Uh, and if we look at how much dissipation is added, so you, could, uh, you look at the uh, right hand side plot here, you can see that this is indeed under dissipative, the, con the convention of six order schemes, and you can design your schemes to be over dissipative for a uh, given range of scale. This is very similar to uh, SVV uh, approach. SVV is a spectral vanishing viscosity, which are spectral methods that have been designed to add some numerical dissipation. And this is very uh, similar to some uh, larger dissimulation that have been developed a long time ago, the Cholet Lucia model, where for this one, actually, they decided to add some uh, dissipation also at the, the large scale. But this is also something uh, that we can achieve. How this is working in practice, we can use those, this numerical dissipation in two ways. In a DNS context, we can use this to remove the, uh, the small aliasing errors per use dissipation. And this is a small example for a 2D spatial mixing layer compressible uh, simulation. On the, right hand, on the left hand side, you have the highly resolved and you can see that you're respectful of the scheme that you are using. The resolution is good enough, so you get exactly the same results. Whereas if you use the marginal resolution, you are trying to save some computational time. If you are using the conventional six order schemes, you can see a lot of small spurious oscillation. If you are using a, a little bit of extra dissipation, in that case, about four times more dissipation at the small scale than a conventional scheme, you can see that you match the results obtained at high resolution. This is one way of using, um, of using the schemes. The other way is, of course, you switch from a DNS study to LES study. And here, this is an example of the flow 3D turbulent uh, round jet. And you can see that this is the DNS uh, results. This is the nozzle simulated by immersive boundary method. This is a simulation performed with 1,000 CPU core on uh, 1,000 cube mesh node for 24 hours to get the statistics. Uh, by using the numerical dissipation, you can switch from a DNS 10,000 uh, Reynolds 10,000 to LES Reynolds 700,000. And you can see that the flow is extremely clean. There is no spurious oscillation. You can see that the range of scale have been increased dramatically. And uh, it's mean that it's very easy for us at the same cost of a DNS, you can uh, match uh, experimental, experimental data. Right, um, I am going to speed up. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about applications. And for this presentation, I've decided to talk about um, active control of various flow configurations. So the first one, I'm going to talk about control of turbulent jets. And what we are trying to do here is we are trying to reproduce some experimental device that have been developed uh, recently in the US and in, in France. So I'm talking about uh, plasma actuators and I'm talking about microfluidic actuator. The application is very simple. You know that now um, some uh, engines uh, are, are designed with, this, uh, with those uh, uh, chevron shape here. The idea is that you can uh, uh, dramatically reduce the noise of the jet and this is a very uh, uh, sensitive uh, topic these days. However, those uh, chevron here, they are coming with, when you are during flight, during a cruise, uh, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny drag penalty and the, the, you are using a tiny, tiny, uh, small amount of uh, fuel, more than uh, conventional um, engines. So active flow control would be beneficial in this case. So is there a way to use active control to mimic those uh, Chevron device during landing and takeoff when you want to reduce the noise, but then uh, have them uh, off uh, during cruise? And this is just an example. If you have a jet and if you do nothing, you will have a high level of noise. If you are trying to play around uh, um, with the jet, then you will be able to reduce the noise. This is a very um, well-known uh, mechanism. You can see some, some examples uh, from, from uh, NASA of, of Chevron and how they are trying to play with, uh, with the turbulent jet. 
So we, we, we started working on this uh, a long time ago uh, at the University of Poitiers and when the code was not parallelized, uh, this is the experimental setup where you have um, microjets that are going to impact uh, on the jet. So these are the microjet, this is the main jet here. And we were asked by the experimentalist to reproduce and we were not able to do that. We were able to do this only like two microjets. But now that we have the parallel version of the code, we are able to do the, the full um, the full uh, nozzle with the microjet. And this is done with the immersive boundary method. So you can see that uh, this is a, 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 a quite complicated uh, setup, but uh, we are able to, 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 to match uh, the, the experiments. And I'm just going to show you a, a quick movie. This is uh, the first movie on the left is going to be what's happening when you don't have the microjet. You can see that uh, the transition to turbulence for the jet is, is very long and you have those very large ring shaped structure and they are very, very noisy. If you are using the microjets, and this is the, the next simulation, uh, you can see that the flow is becoming turbulent instantaneously and the microjets are going to introduce some kinetic energy to the flow and they are going to destroy those very large uh, uh, ring structure. And this is another example here on the right. You can see the large ring structures here. When you superimpose the microjet, this is what you get. And those microjets in green are going to completely destroy uh, the large ring structure and you will get uh, the picture at the bottom. Okay, and we have been working extensively with the simulation trying to understand how the microjet are interacting with the jet. They are creating some horseshoes vortex that are going to impact and create, add some energy and will destroy um, the interface and will uh, reduce noise and uh, increase mixing. As another way of, of dealing with uh, active flow control for jet, we looked also at using uh, uh, plasma uh, plasma actuators, we know that plasma actuators can add some momentum to the flow. So the idea by adding some uh, plasma actuator here is that you can speed up uh, the flow inside the, um, in, inside the nozzle and you can, this is what you will get inside. I don't have too much time, I'm, I, I see I'm running out of time, but you can see that for different setup, um, you can create some very elongated streamwise in the streamwise direction voltages that are also going to uh, impact uh, the property of, of the jet. You can reduce um, the potential core, you can increase the, the spreading of the jet, and uh, as a result, you can, uh, you can increase dramatically uh, the mixing property of the jet. Here is, uh, we used a, a passive scalar, and for this, uh, we looked at the probability density function and what you want, so you start with a, a, a passive scalar that is equal to one inside the jet and zero everywhere. And a measure of good mixing is when your, your PDF is very narrow. It means that uh, the, the, the scalar field is homogeneous and when your, uh, the, the, the average value um, is between uh, zero and one. And you can see that when you are using a, a, a pulsated uh, uh, plasma actuators, this is the, the blue line here, you can have very, very uh, good mixing. So the, the, I don't have time to spend too much time on that, but using plasma actuators uh, seems to be very beneficial in terms of, in terms of mixing. Uh, I would like to present you with two more uh, configuration. The, the, the second one uh, here is um, uh, how to reduce the drag on the turbulent boundary layer. Everyone is, uh, is working on this. However, we, we've decided to do something slightly different. We were not interested in, in uh, uh, drag reduction. We were interested in, is it possible to generate net energy saving? Most of the drag reduction techniques that are being used are very uh, costly. So at the end, yes, you can reduce the drag quite substantially, but in practice, if you were to use your drag technique on an airplane, uh, you would uh, consume more energy. So this is just, uh, the, the traditional slide from, uh, this is a, a picture that has been uh, taken from a, a paper from uh, Kornilov and this just to tell you that uh, the, the, uh, the friction drag is about half of the uh, total drag on an aircraft and uh, what's going on on the wing and what's going on on the fuselage is, is, is fairly important. So a, a tiny reduction of drag with a, a, an energy efficient drag reduction technique would potentially be very, very interesting. And in order to do that, we've decided to combine our X Compact 3D uh, framework with a Bayesian optimization uh, method. And Bayesian optimization is a very nice way of optimizing a problem. So you have, we are going to have a lot of parameters for our uh, uh, 
control strategy and the Bayesian optimization will find the right set of parameters to maximize the drug reduction or to maximize the net energy saving. How it's working, it's working with uh, uncertainty and uh, mean. So you're, you're taking a few points and you are trying to, so the true function is the, the black one, you don't know it, and you are trying to map it with only a few points and the Bayesian optimization is doing this very nicely, but by looking is where the uncertainty is maximum and where it is maximum, then you add your second point and then you carry on until you find the, the minimum of the value or the maximum of the value. So we try to do that for our boundary layer. This is uh, what you get. We have a control area. We are using wall blowing. We know that low intensity, normal wall blowing is very efficient in terms of drug reduction. And we try to investigate if it was possible to use intermittent well blowing uh, to generate net energy saving. So these are uh, the parameter of the, of the simulations. Uh, and we, we, we've started at fairly low Reynolds number up to Reynolds uh, theta equal 2000. Uh, of course, the key here is that uh, we need to find a way to evaluate the cost of the, of the, of the blowing. So we played with two systems. The first one was a, a published one from Russia, but they were missing the cost of the compressing air. So the estimation for the energy saving were quite optimistic. The second one, <coughs> sorry, is a system developed at the University of Newcastle. And this is based on uh, mini speakers. So we are using a sound wave to generate the normal wall blowing. And this is a, a very efficient way of generating uh, a, small, a low intensity normal wall blowing. This is what uh, you will get. And when you do a Bayesian optimization, you try several parameters. This is what you will get. The, the pink here is the control area. You can see that you can generate uh, a drug reduction up to uh, like 90, 95%. Um, so if we look at, at the data in, in uh, more uh, detail, uh, the, this is a, a set of Bayesian optimization. You can see that you can generate a, a, a very high drug reduction, but this is not energy efficient. Whereas if you find the right set of parameter, your drug reduction is not that high, but then you can generate 5% of energy saving. This was done with the Russian model, which I've said before is not realistic. So we've decided to do it again with the system from Newcastle. And you can see that uh, once again, we are able to generate a tiny percentage of uh, net energy saving using um, intermittent wall blowing. You can also see that the, the Bayesian optimization was able to find a, a drug reduction technique with a maximum drag of up to 94% here. And then you have, uh, you have a, a recovery here uh, in the boundary layer. And so if you compute the total drug reduction from start to end, you get something like a, a 34%. But once again, if you don't do things properly, it will be more expensive than uh, with no control. Right, uh, I'm going to speed up. I only have three, four slides. Uh, the next one is uh, control about uh, wind farm. This is very nice pictures taken from the Horn Rev uh, wind farm in, in Denmark. And you can have a look at this paper. They have some amazing picture. The main issue with the current uh, wind farm is that uh, they don't generate as much power as uh, expected. The reason is, is because here you can see that um, the, the, the wake of this turbine here is going to impact the wake uh, of this one here. And then the power output in the downstream turbine is going to be very low. If you are in a setup like the one below here, um, this turbine here is going to be fine, but this one is going to produce a uh, reduced amount of uh, power. And the reason why is that you have a, a very turbulent, intermittent incoming flow and um, the turbines are not designed for this. Uh, we are talking about very large wind turbines. We are talking about turbines that are the size of the Eiffel Tower or the size of the Shard. Um, uh, so we are talking about very large structure. Okay, so this is very important to better understand this. There is a lot of issues in terms of aeroelasticity, in terms of fatigue load, and this is all connected to wake-to-wake -to -wake interaction, and this is all connected to uh, how uh, the turbulence is impacting uh, the downstream turbine. So here's just a small movie where you see that when the two turbines are behind each other, you can see the power reduction here is, is, is quite dramatic. The power here uh, is between four and six uh, kilowatts. 
And when we are going to slightly shift uh, the turbine, the first one, you can see that the power output is going to be uh, much better. So to simulate uh, those turbines, we are using uh, various techniques called the actuator line model or actuator surface model or uh, actuator disk model. So we are not simulating the actual turbines. We are, we are only simulating uh, the resulting forces. So the thrust, the drag, the lift, and so on. But you can see here that the, the drag is not between four and uh, the power output is not between four and six is, 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 is much better. So these are some nice uh, simulation of a generic wind farm with uh, four by four turbines. And uh, we are looking at different uh, control strategy. Uh, the greedy mode is when each turbine is trying to generate as much power as possible without thinking of the other one. And the cooperative one is when you are playing with the yaw angle uh, of the turbine. You can see that uh, when the turbines are talking to each other to avoid uh, generating too much turbulence, then you can see that the total power output can be increased quite substantially by about 20%. Okay. Now, if you're wondering when you say, oh, why they design uh, two uh, uh, turbines like this? Well, if the wind is coming in this direction, then of course, it doesn't make sense. But then most of the time, the winds are coming in different direction. So there is no easy way to, to, to design a, a wind farm layout, right? So the only way to deal with this is to use some uh, advanced control technique. And this is something that we can do easily um, with our code. Right, this is my last slide. Um, I've showed you that, well, what I think is a successful cocktail to deal with turbulent flows. Uh, high order finite different schemes on a Cartesian mesh, 2D domain decomposition, immersive boundary method and numerical dissipation. What we're interested in cost, accuracy, simplicity, and versatility. And we can do all of this uh, very easily um, with the X-Compact 3D framework. In terms of application, I showed you some uh, turbulent jet boundary layer and wind farm, but we are also uh, looking at drag reduction uh, of bluff bodies with flaps, um, turbulence modeling with uh, neural network. Um, we are trying to also solve the Poisson equation uh, with neural network. It's a very interesting work. We are looking at bussiness, non-bussiness, gravity currents, and at uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So what I want to say is we, we are able to study a wide range of, of turbulent flow with this, with this uh, X-Compact 3D framework. If you're interested um, in, in, uh, in using uh, this uh, framework, uh, there is a website. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, put in the chat uh, the links because, of course, uh, you cannot click on my uh, screen. But basically, the X Compact 3D is open source, so it's free to use for everyone. You can follow us on Twitter, and uh, if you have nothing to do on on Friday, we are organizing a, a showcase event. And if you click on the first link, uh, you will find all the information on how to register. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm I'm a bit uh, well. I, I ran out of time, maybe. So thank you very much. Perfect talk. Thanks again for giving nice presentation and open the floor for questions. Please unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any. I guess we might start with Hello. Okay, go ahead. Can I ask something? Sorry. Uh, hi, uh, Sivan. Very nice, very nice presentation. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is when you reconstruct the flow inside, the, the, the fake flow inside the body. Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned you take care of the velocity at the interfaces such that it is zero at the, at the boundaries. Yes. Um, and this is the only constraint you have to reconstruct the flow inside. But uh... do you... So do you take care of the gradients as well? Do you check the gradients? Uh, uh, so at the moment, you don't need to take into account the gradient. Uh, I mean, the only constraint with the immersive boundary method is that you want to impose a zero velocity at the wall of your solid body, okay? Mm -hmm. And the gradient is being taken care of with the cubic spline or the Lagrangian polynomials. Now, we, we are also currently developing a technique where you, if you want to impose, if, let's say if you have a scalar, <coughs> a temperature field of something where you need to impose a gradient, then this method is also compatible with that. 
So you can also keep, uh, you can also impose a gradient if you were, if you want to. But for the velocity, we are only dealing with imposing a zero velocity, uh, uh, no slip boundary condition. And the okay. gradient is being taken care of, but you don't change, you don't change the gradient on the fluid side. The gradient of the fluid side, you only reconstruct on the solid side. And, and what do you do if you have singularities in the middle, for example? So you, you, you might have points where you get influence from both si every all sides, right? So yes. So for, for for in those situations when there is not a lot of points inside the solid, then uh, we are trying to play with uh, the number of points used um, for the reconstruction. But of course, it it will not work if you only have uh, three or four points inside the solid. Okay. So do you have but a reference? Otherwise, other, sorry? No, do you have a reference for this work or for this thing? Um, yes. I, if you check my paper in one month or so, uh, we, <laughs> there is a, a paper that is going to be accepted very, very soon. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe I can write you an email and you can forward Absolutely. it to me. Absolutely. Uh, we have an old paper with the Lagrange polynomial, but there is a new one coming with the cubics plan and moving objects. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, send me an email. And okay. I can see there is a question on the... Yeah, it's a question in the chat box. It's relating yeah. to the weaker scaling. And yeah. he's asking but, how your weaker scaling is on this chord. Yeah, so the, the, the weak scaling is, is excellent. Uh, it's excellent, but it's, it's not as good as the strong scaling um, for uh, uh, the reason I mentioned, but uh, the, the weak scaling is, is, is very good. Uh, once again, uh, if you find the right balance between the number of, uh, uh, number of mesh node per core. Um, but the, we have some, uh, if you look at uh, our paper, the, the weak scaling is, um, is, is very good and, and there, is no, there is no issues with that. If you write once again, if you find the, if if you have an optimal number of mesh nodes per per core, and usually I'm talking about um, between two hundred thousand mesh nodes per core and uh, five hundred thousand mesh nodes per core. If you do that, you, your your weak scaling uh, will be excellent. Sorry. If you use a, a smaller number of of uh, mesh nodes per core, then the weak scaling will not be good. Maybe I can ask another question. Um, very, very, very easy one, I guess. Uh, for the Clayton line model, you you need CL and CD values for the for the forces you you yes. include. Do you correct those when you have turbulent uh, inflows or when you have gust effects or dynamic stall, this kind of stuff? No, that that's that no that that's the that's the limitation uh, of the of the technique. So you get those numbers for uh, uh, uniform uh, incoming uh, velocity. Okay. We, we can have, we, we have some, uh, some tip correction and there are some small correction that can be applied, but they are uh, empirical uh, uh, correction. Okay. So this Did is, you check if this is important or? Well, if you are dealing with, uh, at the moment we are not dealing with, uh, we are dealing with um, atmospheric boundary layer with a, a fairly low level of turbulence. We are talking about uh, 5%, 6 7% of turbulence. So for that amount of uh, turbulence, it's not impacting. I mean, you can match the experimental data uh, very easily. Uh, but of course, if you are dealing with very big gust or, or very intense uh, incoming flow, then I believe there will be some issues here. But at the moment, we have restrained ourselves to a low intensity uh, atmospheric Bondi layer. Okay, thank you. I guess if we, there is no more question, we might wrap up here and thanks again, Sylvan, for his great talk and interesting research with many many, many information. I guess people might watch these videos many times. Thanks.
Um, and of course, I mean, uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please send me an email. Um, yeah, I will be happy to uh, answer any question. This is my email address.